Right. So, hello, my name is James England. I'm one of the clinical research fellows in the Tony and Elizabeth Comper MPN program at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto, Canada. And I'm here today to talk about our abstract exploring clinical and molecular features of JAK inhibitor failure in patients with myeloid fibrosis. Uh, so for the last number of years, our only medical therapy for myeloid fibrosis has been with the JAK inhibitor ruxolitinib, uh, which is very effective at improving symptoms and reducing spleen size, but it's limited in that uh, most patients have failure of this uh, therapy after about two to three years. Uh, recently, with the approval of fidratinib, as well as numerous phase three studies evaluating second-line JAK inhibitors uh, and combination therapy in the presence of uh, JAK inhibitor failure, uh, we have more options than ever for these patients, but there's a lack of data to guide really how to manage uh, JAK inhibitor failure. So our study uh, evaluated a uh, molecularly annotated cohort of 113 patients uh, with extended follow-up, uh, encompassing a cumulative incidence of failure of 95%, uh, with failure categorized according to the consensus criteria put forward by the Canadian NPN group, uh, which categorizes failure uh, due to lack of or loss of spleen response, development of cytopenias, progression of the disease to an acceleration or blast phase, development of non-hematologic toxicity, uh, or the uh, development of a secondary malignancy. Uh, in our cohort, survival following a uh, failure of frontline JAK inhibitor therapy was quite poor with a median uh, overall survival of 13.6 months, uh, which was impacted uh, in multivariate analysis uh, by clinical features, including the DIP score at time of failure, the ECOG performance uh, status, uh, as well as the pattern of failure with the patients who have progression of the disease to an acceleration of blast phase have sig uh, significantly shorter survival than those who had uh, failure due to uh, lack of or loss of spleen response. For a subset of our uh, cohort, we had paired samples available both at the time of initiation and uh, failure of JAK inhibitor therapy. Uh, and repeated uh, mutation analysis demonstrated that emergent mutations were present in 39% of patients at time of JAK inhibitor failure. Uh, the most common mutations uh, were found in KRAS and ASFZL1, uh, while the most common groups of mutations were either those that were previously established in other work as high molecular risk mutations, uh, including ASFZL1, SRSF2, and IDH mutations. Uh, and those that uh, activated the RAS pathway, including NRAS, KRAS, CBL, and PTP N11. Uh, we found that uh, emergent mutations were uh, least likely to be found in those who had failure due to cytopenias, while those uh, with acceleration or blast phase disease were the most likely to have uh, the presence of emergent mutations. Uh, we found that uh, either the development of emergent mutations uh, or the uh, presence of persistent or emergent high methyl risk uh, or RAS pathway activating mutations, uh, all impacted uh, overall survival following JAK inhibitor uh, failure. So in summary, uh, JAK inhibitor failure uh, is associated with a significant uh, uh, worse prognosis, uh, which is impacted both by clinical features as well as the uh, presence of emergent mutations, most notably uh, persistent or emergent high methyl risk or, or RAS pathway activating mutations. Uh, 